Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all once again to another Wednesday night stu Bible study. And tonight, what we are going to do is to continue to go through uh, the book of Acts. If you uh, tuned in with us last week, then you know we spent the majority of the time going over the first two chapters in Acts. And then what we did, we closed out with uh, the top half of chapter 3. Then Sunday... I preached the top half of chapter 4. So if my calculations are correct, that means we missed the bottom half of chapter 3. And you're probably sitting there saying like, what in the world are you talking about? What's this bottom half? What's this top half? What's the bottom half of Acts 3? And see, I told you I'm talking about that's how I see it. When I study my Bible, when I read Scripture, I see it that way. Whether this is what happened in the top half, this was the middle part of it, this is the bottom half. And I want you guys to start being able to do the same things. I want you to not only hear the lesson, but I want you to be able to see it in your Bible, scripturally, what it says, and be able to apply it to our lives. See, I want you to be able to teach them, just like I'm teaching you. I want you to be able to talk about Scripture and be comfortable talking about them. Uh, there's this kind of craze that, that's went over the last uh, few years, I guess, it's took over. It's uh, that Ancestry.com. And people are really interested in finding out about uh, their heritage. And, and I recently went to dinner with a couple, and one of their children for Christmas had got them like this extensive ancestry report uh, on his family and they're giving it to him for a Christmas gift. And, and as I listened to him while we were at dinner uh, explain this to me, see he, he spoke with like excitement. He, he spoke with enthusiasm. He, he spoke with a, a sense of pride and he didn't miss a beat. That was because it's like it's part of him. It's where he came from. And, and listen, that's what the book of Acts is for us as a body of Christ. See, it shows the birth of the church. It shows how the church started. The hardships, uh, the persecutions, the, the triumphs, the miracles, all in the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. And it's really, really cool. And see, when, when you speak about it, I want you to speak with excitement. I want you to speak with, with enthusiasm. I want you to speak with, with a sense of pride because it's a part of you. See, we cannot, listen to this, we cannot be ignorant of the Scripture because as we'll see tonight, uh, we cannot use ignorance as an excuse. So, so let's talk about the book of Acts. And as I said, this is how we're going to roll with our lessons. If you look at Acts chapter 1, this is what we've went over. We know why it's called the book of Acts. That's because it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We know who wrote it. We see at the very first uh, verse in Acts 1, he's writing to Theophilus. We also see that Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, wrote to Theophilus. Therefore, we put two and the two together. He says in my former book, O Theophilus, that Luke wrote the book of Acts. We see in the top half of Acts chapter 1, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to the apostles. We also see in that same top half, Jesus ascends into heaven and, and leaves the, the, the apostles behind and tells them to wait on the Holy Spirit. Top half. That's the top half of Acts 1. Now, if we were to look at the bottom half of Acts 1, we also see where Matthias, he actually replaces Judas because we know that Judas ended up hanging himself. All right, so that's Acts 1. We know why it's called Acts. We know who wrote it. Top half of Acts 1, bottom half of Acts 1. Moving on to Acts uh, chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost. We're in the top half, right? We learned last week why it's called Pentecost. Penta means 50. It's 50 days after the Passover. All right, so now I want you to see it. I want you to see Acts chapter 2. They're all in the upper room. They are all together, and it says the Holy Spirit came upon them. It says tongues of fire appeared over top of their head, and they began to speak in other tongues. The apostles, right? And Pastor Clark has preached this. We talked about it last week. It's not what we think of speaking in tongues now. It's that they understood each other in different languages, 
right? So that, that would be the top half of Acts 1. The middle, this is the first time I'm going to hit this, it's like the middle part of Acts chapter 2 is where the apostles preach the first gospel sermon to ever be preached. Right, This Jesus whom you crucified, God's made him both Lord and Messiah. It says the people are cut to their heart, replied, what do we do? Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, That's the middle part. 3,000 people received the message and were baptized. The bottom part of Acts chapter 2 the believers, we talked about is Acts 2.42, they became devoted, devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking the bread, and to prayer. So if we were to go over all this, it's like, okay, I see it. I see Acts 2. I see in the top half the Holy Spirit comes upon them. I see in the middle part Peter preaches the first sermon. I see at the bottom part that the believers became devoted, the 3,000 that uh, received the message. So uh, now let's look at Acts chapter 3, which if you were here Sunday, I got into it just a little bit. Right? Peter and John are walking towards the temple, to, are walking towards the temple, and there's a man there that's been lame from birth, uh, begging for money. And he asked Peter and John for some, and this is what Peter said. He said, silver and gold I do not have. Right? What you want, I don't have that. But what I do have, well, this is what you need, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Verse number 7, taking him by his right hand, he helped him up. This lame man that's been lame since birth, he helped him up and instantly, instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God. See, an encounter with the apostles through Christ, he went into the temple changed, right? Different than he has ever been before. And all of us who claim Christ, we should have that exact same testimony, right? At some point, the Holy Spirit of God working through someone changed our lives forever. Now, wouldn't it be crazy if the lame man said, you know what, I think I'll just go back to being lame. You know, all this walking around and jumping up and, and, and all this, I'll just go back to, to begging at, at the gate, the beautiful gate, and uh, no, I don't even care about walking. I just want to be lame the rest of my life. See, uh, of course that would be crazy. But just as crazy for us to go back being the same person we were before Christ. Because I want you to see what happens. Watch verse number 9. When all the, the people, these are people that do not know Christ, when all the people saw him, the lame man, walking and praising God, verse number 10, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And as I said, these, these are people that, that do not know Jesus. But they were filled with wonder and amazement because of the lame man. See, see this is what's going to attract them to come to Peter. Right now, before we get into the bottom half of, of Acts chapter 3, what we're going to talk about tonight, let me touch on that real quick. See, we live in a world that, just like 2,000 years ago, is full of hate. And, and, and if Christ lives inside of you, then you should be full, full of love. Basically, a, a whole lot different than what the world is. See, I would love to meet someone for the first time that comes into Boone's Creek Christian Church. And, and I look at him and I say, what brought you to church this morning? And, and their response be, um, oh, I work with, with such and such. They're, just, they're different. See, the way they care, the, the way they love, the way they act, they're, they're different from everyone else. And, and finally one day I, I just asked them, I said, why are you so different? And they said, it's because of Jesus. Then they invited me to church, and 
Well, I just had to check it out. See, what a concept. Changed people attracting people who want to be changed. So here we go. Let's get into it. The bottom half of Acts 3. We know the top half, the lame man gets healed. The bottom half, here comes all these people. They're like, wow, what? this is crazy. I've seen this guy every day. He's always begging. Now he's walking and praising God. What's going on? Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11. While the man, the lame man, watch what he did. He held on to Peter and John. And listen to this. It's not for support. Like, it's not like he barely got up and started walking and let me figure this out. Remember, no, he was walking uh, and, and he was leaping and praising God. I believe he was there because of uh, maybe gratitude. But also, if you look, all the people were astonished and came running to them. So I'm sure that this lame man's like, wow, I haven't seen this before. Let me get with my friends, the guys that just healed me in the name of Jesus Christ. Because here comes all of these pe people... And it's to a place called Solomon's Colonnade. And what I did is I put a picture of this up. This would have been, the, this is the temple. And it's got two different sections uh, highlighted that I can show you. Over here is Solomon's Colonnade or what they would call Solomon's Porch. So this is where Peter would be preaching. All the people are coming because right here, you see this? This is the beautiful gate. This is where the lame man was sitting. And, and, and when he jumps up and starts leaping and praising God, all these people are like, what's going on? And in the process, Peter moves over here. They call this uh, Solomon's porch or Solomon's colonnade because obviously uh, Solomon, he's the one who built the temple, right? David's son. But around like five, mid-500s B.C., um, Nebuchadnezzar, we talked about him a few weeks back when we was going over Daniel, the wicked king. Uh, remember, he uh, captured Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple. Well, the only thing that remained when he destroyed the temple was this. This would be the original. So this was like really special to the people because this was original. All this would have been rebuilt. But I want you to get that picture. There's the beautiful gate. There's Solomon's porch. Or what I'm saying is when you read this, I want you to see that. Right now you see it. Like this is where this took place. Um, so here we go in, into verse number 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Right, just like Acts chapter 4, what we went over. Remember, Peter, look, I'm nothing. But, but I want you to see what, what Peter does. Right? He's going to use the Old Testament to explain the gospel. Coming up in the next verse, Peter's going to use the Old Testament to explain the gospel. I always like to teach it like this. It's Old Testament concealed, New Testament revealed. Old Testament concealed, New Testament revealed. So here comes uh, verse number 13. This is Peter preaching to the people. Hey, the God of Abraham, you know him. The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. See, you cannot preach the gospel without mentioning Jesus. He says, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. And it's like, really, let him go? Pilate had decided he wanted to, to let Jesus go. Did that really happen? Yeah, it's right here. Watch this. Luke 23, verse 20. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them, appealing to the people. He wanted to release Jesus, verse 21, but they kept shouting, Crucify him. Crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them. Why? Like, I want, I want to let him go. What crime has this man committed? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release them. Verse 23, but with loud shouts, they instantly demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So do you see this? In Acts, Peter is saying, Pilate wanted to let him go. 
And then we go back to the gospel, we can read that. So I love that what Peter's really doing is he's preaching scripture. It's not even been written yet. He was just there, right? He, he, he lived it. So going on to Acts 3, starting in verse 14, picking up in 14. He said, you disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. He's talking about Barabbas. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. And here it is, my favorite phrase in the Bible, but God, like that sounds really bad. You killed the author of life, but here's why you have a chance because of this. But God raised him from the dead. We, we are witnesses of this. Who's the we? Who's standing there with him? John. Right? We, we saw this. And see, watch how John opens up 1 John chapter 1. When he's writing his epistle, he says, that which was from the beginning, which, hey, we've heard it. Which we have what? We, we've seen it. As a matter of fact, we've looked at it and, and our hands We've touched it. Please listen to what we're saying because this is so real. This we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. Remember that from Sunday. I talked about it. Um, they can't help but speak about what we've seen and what we've heard. And that's what John says in his epistle. See, they, they continue to preach the same message. They, they, they've just lived it. And, and that message is this right here. Watch verse 16. Back in Acts chapter 3, by faith in the name of Jesus. See, it's by faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name. And the faith that comes through him, I like this, that he has been completely healed. It's completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, and here's what I talked about at the beginning. I know that you acted in ignorance. Like I know that was ignorance why you did that. And also, so did your leaders, which is really cool. Peter's basically going to be preaching to them in the next chapter. So he says, you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. And let me tell you why they did that. See, they were familiar with the Scripture. They, they were probably more familiar with Scripture than what we are, but they still crucified Jesus. See, they weren't living the Scripture. Ignorance can, can never be used as an excuse. I don't believe one day I get to stand before God and say, sorry, God, I didn't know that part. Nobody ever taught me. Nobody ever, ever, ever told me. See, there's many times that, like, I stood in front of a judge and best believe my defense could have been, hey, judge, I was just ignorant. But that was ignorant for me to do that. But, but see, that wasn't an option. It, it was guilty or, or it was not guilty. I never got to plead ignorance. But, but here is the, is the message. And, and it's the same message that the prophets preached. It's the same message John the Baptist preached. It's the same message that Jesus preached. It's the same message that we've heard Peter be preaching. Watch verse 19. Repent. That's the message. Sin. Repent. Repent from the sin. Then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And it's like, boy, that would be amazing. That's great. I have all my sins forgiven, but, but there's more. And so that times of refreshing, like God's awesome, so that these times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And, and see, I, I talked about this Sunday. One of the hardest things for me to do sometimes is, is tell people the truth. But I'm afraid as a leader, if I'm not uh, preaching repentance, then I'm acting in ignorance. I would be ignorant to think that there is not sin in people's lives. We have to repent of sin. See, see if we do not repent, the refreshing, it, it cannot come. And the refreshing is not going to come unless you repent of sins. If you're being refreshed in sin, then why would you ever want to repent? 
Like if sin is so good, why would we ever repent? Repent, we need to know what that refreshing is. Verse number 20, he's finishing up the sermon. It says, and that he, he being God, may send the Messiah who is being appointed for you. And it says even Jesus. So it's like he's saying, yeah, I'm talking about Jesus. Yeah, even Jesus, that guy you crucified. Verse number 21. Heaven must receive him. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Until God sends him back. As he promised long ago through the holy prophets. And remember, we went over this, right? We know what happens in the top half of Acts chapter 1. Peter saw this. He said, heaven must receive him. Remember what it says in Acts 1. But you will receive, this was Jesus speaking to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and Samaria, to all the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was, there it is, taken up. Remember what Peter's preaching, heaven must receive him. He was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky like, wow, this is crazy, as he is going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, and they say, hey, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go. And there it is. That's what, what Peter's saying. That's what he's preaching to him right there. Once again, he saw this. And that's why he said, he said God must receive him into heaven, and then he will send him back. And, and this is how he closes out. Verse 22. For Moses, pay attention, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Okay, verse 23. Anyone who does not listen to him, well, you'll be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, verse 24. Here's another one. Be beginning with Samuel. All the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And this is what I want you to grasp real quick. Peter just preached the gospel to a group of people that were amazed that this lame man is jumping around and praising God. He preached the gospel. He used Abraham. He used Isaac. He used Jacob. He used Moses. He used Samuel. And so right now, like I'm really appealing to you from the bottom of my heart. Anyone watching this at any time, if you ever get to see this, and you preach the gospel or you teach the gospel, do the same thing. Right, we got a Bible full of examples. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Samuel. That's who Peter just preached. Stop preaching Trump, Biden, Pelosi. Can you imagine that? Like somebody comes to church for the first time because your congregation has been witnessing and they never hear. They hear more about Trump or more about Biden than they hear about Jesus. Stop preaching the, the politics and preach the patriarchs, right? Preach Jesus. Verse 25, and, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all the people on the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each one of you from your wicked ways. Get that. It's a blessing to turn from your wicked ways. And see, the problem is, I think lots of times we don't understand that we're wicked because we're ignorant of the Scripture. See, you notice in this message from Peter, what he did is he preached repentance like really early. At the very beginning, he said, repent. If you were to look at Acts chapter 2, it wasn't until the bottom of the message 
that he mentioned the word repent. So why in this message did he, he mention repentance at the very beginning? Well, if you were with us on Sunday, you know what's getting ready to happen in, in Acts chapter 4. And I would say Peter knew this was coming as well. Like, I'm right here at this temple. I'm sure they're going, getting ready. It's all getting ready to go down. Everybody's getting ready to come. They're going to arrest me. So let me get the main message out first. The main message is repent. And you can do that. And he continued to preach through Christ. But he hit that early because he knew this was happening, right? Here comes Acts 4, verse 1. The priest, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John right in the middle of all this. While they were speaking to the people, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail to the next day. But many who heard the message, what did they do? They believed. What was that message? Repent. Because you killed Jesus, you'll get this refreshing. And as I said, Peter hit that early. I would imagine he knew this is getting ready to come. So the number grew from three th to about 5,000. So the, the number grew through the message of the cross. 5,000 have repented or 5,000 have been blessed. So, so let's look back at what we've learned tonight in, in Acts chapter 3. Right, We'll be at the top half, top half, Acts 3, lame man healed at the gate, beautiful, been lame since birth, always begs for money. Right, He asked Peter and John, still in the top half of it, they, what do they say? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you freely. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. That's the top half of Acts 3. All right. The bottom half, we see that these big crowds come because they're, they're like, wow, this lame man. He's been lame since birth, and he's leaping, and he's praising God. And, and we got in our mind now, they come to Solomon's colonnade or Solomon's porch. We've also learned that Peter said, hey, we know you killed Jesus in ignorance, but ignorance cannot be an excuse. And always, like any time you see the gospel preached, you can probably put this up. Peter preached uh, repentance. All right, so, so now everyone should, should be prepared, right? Because I preached the top half of Acts 4 Sunday. And we see in the top half of Acts 4 that Peter and John get arrested, but not before the number grew to 5,000 uh, people that believed the message. Also, we know in the top half of Acts 4 that the way Peter spoke Right, they, they realized that he was just ordinary, untrained man, and because that lame man was, was still with them, remember that it's like, we can't even say anything, it, it left them speechless. We see them release Peter and John, and then they command them uh, not to speak again in the name of Jesus. That's the top half of Acts 4. Sunday, Pastor Clark will start the bottom half of Acts 4. And I truly believe if you've watched this the last couple of weeks, then you should know exactly where we're at. You should come in Sunday prepared to receive the message that the Holy Spirit of God will give through Pastor Clark. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us, God. Thank you for an opportunity to go over your word. I know that there's a lot of things I went over a couple of times uh, that people have heard before, but let it be a refreshing to them, God. Uh, any, anything that I spoke, Lord, let it be all of you so that it, it sits inside of our hearts. God goes through our minds and we're able to continue to grow in this gospel of Christ and how powerful it is. Thank you for accounts that we can read uh, of Peter and John and the apostles and see how they acted, how they acted and how they spread the gospel and how we're still able to talk about it to this day 2,000 years later. And it's really cool. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Take 
dead men walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me on to bed's eyes. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Yeah.